Hello and welcome to this e-open house at NUS Law. My name is Eleanor Wong. I'm the Vice Dean here for Student Life and Global Relations and it's my pleasure this evening to host this session and also to introduce you right now to my fellow panelists who handle the difficult questions. First, uh, to my left is um, our Dean, uh, Professor Simon Chesterman. Further to the left is Vice Dean for Academic Affairs, uh, uh, Professor David Tan. And then on my right is someone who knows NUS Law inside and out. She obtained her LLB here and then her LLM, and she now also teaches an, as an adjunct with us while running her own legal skills training company. So she's here to sort of give the student perspective, but she really knows everything. And um, this is my dear friend, Sim Hadija. Um, we're especially pleased tonight um, that you are with us because we do know that you have many choices as you consider how to advance your qualifications and your career. Um, and we welcome the chance uh, to share with you how we hope that NUS Law is the right institution for you, whether you're a law graduate, a lawyer, thinking of doing a master's, or uh, you're someone who has a previous degree that's not from law, but you're thinking perhaps of a career change um, or learning a bit more about law. And um, in all those areas, uh, we like to think that NUS has offerings that will meet your needs. And to kick the session off and to share um, perhaps a big overview of that with you, uh, it's my pleasure to pass the time now to our Dean, Professor Simon Chesterman. Thanks, El, and I echo you in welcoming everyone who's taking part in this uh, discussion. We really are going to look forward to your questions, so you can already start typing them in if you wish. Uh, and I'll welcome, if you like, in three groups, because I think there are three potential groups that are paying attention to this. People interested in our JD, Path to Legal Practice in Singapore, people interested in the LLM, the Master of Laws, uh, an advanced legal degree for someone already uh, with a qualification, uh, and possibly some PhD students as well. So if you're interested in a JD, one of the, this is the inaugural batch that we're about to admit in August, uh, the first year, but of course we're admitting on a rolling basis. Uh, and this really is our effort to develop a premier graduate law degree to produce the next generation of lawyers who will qualify to practice in Singapore, but many of whom will also have qualifications to enable them to practice elsewhere. So really a global program for a global profession. Um, some of you are here because you're thinking about the Master of Laws program, our one-year LLM. Uh, that would enable people who already have a legal qualification to specialise uh, and to go deep into the vast range of uh, specialisations that we have uh, and the breadth of subjects that we have from our own faculty and faculty from around the world, something I think David will speak about shortly. Uh, and then a third group is uh, people thinking about maybe doing a PhD. Uh, and if you're thinking about that, you're potentially thinking about academia, really immersing yourself in legal research, uh, and we've got a great tradition in that area also. So you, whether you fit into any of these baskets, why should you be applying to NUS? And I'll summarise it in three words. National, global, Asia. We're the National University of Singapore. We're Asia's global law school, located in and focused on Asia. We're the oldest law school in Singapore. We're the most established. Our alumni include the current Chief Justice, the past Chief Justice, the current Attorney General, past Attorney General, partners in all the major law firms, not only in Singapore, but also in places like London, New York, Shanghai, Hong Kong. Uh, and so uh, we have this sort of great tradition as the National Law School of Singapore. We're also a global school. We're partnered in, with major law schools around the world. We bring faculty from around the world. We recruit students from around the world. It's a truly global environment. We're one of the only law schools I know where no one on our faculty was only educated in Singapore. Everyone has a degree from at least one foreign jurisdiction. Many of us have degrees from multiple jurisdictions. And then thirdly, we're an Asian law school. We are deeply engaged with the region. We aspire to being uh, a dynamic part of a dynamic area of the world, the most economically uh, active uh, and increasingly politically significant. So if any of this sounds relevant to you, then maybe NUS is where you should be studying. Thank you, Simon. And uh, indeed, if you are wondering what some of the programs are that are available to you, no one is better um, placed to address that than um, my colleague, Professor David Tan, who is in charge of academic affairs. You notice that I got myself the easy portfolio. Yeah. You know, it's student life. I hang around with, with, with the students and kid all the time. But David has a serious job, and he's not going to answer the serious yeah, question. Yeah, I, I get the tough job. Uh, warm welcome. 
I oversee the teaching curriculum uh, for both the undergraduate and the, the graduate program. Uh, so just very quickly about the JD, uh, we're launching it next year. We've in fact started our interviews and we'll be making offers in, in a month or two. But if you're interested in the JD, do look for more information on our website. Uh, we open admissions in around, I think, November applications. Uh, and they close uh, towards the end of December this year. Uh, for the master's degree program, perhaps I can tell you a little bit more about the LLM. We have seven specializations. Uh, you can see them on our website. They range from Asian legal studies to IP and technology law to maritime law. Uh, two particular programs I think is worth highlighting. One of them is the International Business Law, LLM where you get to spend one semester at uh, NUS in Singapore and the second semester at East UPL in Shanghai. So you get kind of the best of both worlds in Asia, uh, in Singapore and in China. Um, the other program, it's our LLM in International Arbitration and Dispute Resolution. Uh, that one allows you a double LLM if you, if you want where you spend one year at NUS and one semester, half a year at Geneva, uh, Geneva MITS. So you get two LLMs from both institutions. And uh, I, I think that's all I have to say about the program, but I yeah. want to talk about our visitors very quickly. Yeah. I think the benefit of doing an LLM here is that we bring about over 20 visiting professors from around the world to teach at NUS. Uh, they come from Yale, Harvard, Oxford, NYU, Toronto, Melbourne, Tsinghua, Seoul National University. So you don't have to go to all those law schools. You come here and you truly get a global education. Okay. And, um, you know, I, I suppose those are all the reasons why um, uh, someone like Ja um, might be a masochist. And having already gotten her first degree um, uh, from NUS Law, including spending her first year with me, um, nevertheless uh, sort of uh, bit the bullet and came, came right back again. But maybe you can share sort of what went on in your mind as you were, you were thinking. And I know you'd already been very successful. You were, you know, you were a district judge. Um, but but uh, instead of perhaps um, jumping on a plane and going somewhere else to, to, to do uh, an LLM somewhere else, yeah. uh, you came back to your alma mater and mm -hmm. perhaps you can share what went through your mind and why you did that. Okay, I mean, uh, between the LLB and the LLM, uh, there was sort of a 10 year period where I was in practice uh, and then I was at the court. So I was uh, an ER in the Supreme Court for a while and then I was posted to the family court to be a district judge. Um, and during this time, I was also starting to formulate, uh, you know, the idea for my training business. Uh, and just to share a little bit about that training business, uh, Lacuna basically is a legal skills training firm, which I started after I left the courts, so as to level that playing field and give uh, all the young lawyers, uh, particularly young lawyers, a good uh, grounding uh, in some of the advanced uh, legal skills that I, I thought that they should uh, have an opportunity to learn about. So. At this point in time, uh, it was quite clear to me after mm. experiencing practice, after being in the courts, um, that I really, really loved to teach, which I was doing on a part-time basis. And I thought to myself that if I love that so much, then I sh that's, that's what I should be doing. So um, I decided that the path was going to lead me back to academia. Um, and, and before I came and, and joined uh, NUS uh, in terms of you know, teaching uh, uh, more than one module, I decided, well, let's just go and do my LLM. And so the question then arose, well, where should I do it, right? I could do it uh, overseas, I could do it in Singapore. Um, but between, in that 10 year time frame between uh, my LLB and my LLM, uh, a lot of very positive changes had taken place uh, at NUS and the curriculum had vastly expanded in terms of breadth, in terms of depth. Um, and there was so many uh, modules that I really, really wanted to take. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought, well, if all those amazing professors are gathering at NUS and teaching at NUS, then it's a one-stop shop for me. Mm -hmm. So um, the other, of course, the other consideration was I wanted to stay close to my family, uh, have a lot of dependents. Uh, and so it was a good sort of uh, a compromise, as it were, to say, okay, why don't I have that international education while staying domestic? 
and and so that was the thinking behind it, and that's why I came back. Of course, I missed you, and you know, <laughs> like you said, masochistic. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, um, uh, thank you so much, Ja. And um, perhaps what we can do now is um, we'll start to um, let's just jump straight into it. Yeah. We'll, we'll start to take questions. They're already filling up the Q and A um, uh, box, and um, maybe we start because uh, quite a lot of them are about the JD program because it, uh, it's it's new. Perhaps um, uh, why don't we start by focusing on some of the questions that have to do with the JD um, uh, the JD program? And I think one of the questions uh, that's come up a few times is. Um, how is the NUS Law JD program different from the one from SMU, if, if, if there is? Um, and maybe you can share um, a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, I suppose this is... Um, Simon, you want to take that? Okay. Uh, okay. Ours is better. <laughs> um, no, so, so what, what, is, what is the difference? So SMU is a very good law school headed by one of our graduates. Uh, and I think it's really healthy that Singapore has a, a thriving legal education market now. There are three law schools. Uh, of course, we're the best. Um, but the difference is really goes back to the point David was making about breadth, but also depth. Um, so the breadth is the range of subjects that we have. So we want people to have the opportunity to specialise, but we don't want them to narrow themselves too early. And in particular, in the JD, we are holding this out as a as equally as rigorous as our undergraduate program that has become a kind of gold standard in Singapore. So we have that sort of breadth of subjects. We have these visitors from around the world. We have many more subjects just because we're bigger uh, than SMU. But we also have depth. We have professors who are expert in their field. We publish the major journals in Singapore. We publish many more books. Uh, and so what this means is that the JD will be truly global because you'll be part of that global um, classroom. Uh, but really offers the breadth and depth of a, of a NUS education. Uh, because when we were setting this program up, one of the things that all of our stakeholders said was that this JD, because it's a pathway to practice in Singapore, must be no less rigorous than our undergraduate LLB that's been around for, for decades. Uh, and that's why we're requiring interviews and a written test, so that the people who come into that program have gone through the same kind of rigorous selection that we impose on our LLB students, and we're confident that the graduates will both be as effective, uh, but also have similar opportunities to the graduates coming out of our LLB program. Right, and you mentioned the, the, the written test, and we, we have someone um, who uh, obviously uh, has already been shortlisted to, uh, to be considered, congratulations, but who's saying, I'm feeling very worried about the upcoming written test for the JD program. I have been reading newspapers and trying sample questions from the Cambridge Law Test to prepare. May I ask, what is the best way to prepare for the law written test for the JD? David. Oh, I, I would say Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> I think you just need to relax because uh, before we get to the written test, we, we do have a two-year JD. I think that's something SMU does not have. Mm. So at the onset, if you already have a law degree, uh, but it doesn't allow you to practice in Singapore, you can do the two-year JD. And then that would allow you to practice in Singapore, provided you get at least a JD with merit. So a mere pass, you will not be able to do so. Uh, and then you have the three-year JD for those who already have a degree, say in science or economics, but you want to practice law. Uh, so, so that's the difference. And then the written test is also different. So if you already have a law degree, your written test presupposes you have some legal knowledge and you'll be asked to compare a situation you're given uh, with something that you might have learned in a previous law degree. Uh, for those who don't have a law degree, don't worry, it's a bit like GP where you're given a scenario, you just have to reason through. Uh, you, you don't need to read any law books. So, so the best thing to do is read newspapers, read, uh, go on the internet, look, look at what's trending on Google. It's just general knowledge and then you have to analyze a particular scenario. Yeah, so the written test for, for a two-year JD is very different from a three-year JD. Okay. And that also sets us apart from SMU. Right, right. Um, and I suppose the, the test for the three-year JD is um, uh, probably not so different from the test that Ja took many, many years ago <laughs> <laughs> uh, when applying for our, our LLB. I'm not sure if you actually remember what it was like, but the, the big question is, did you really have to prepare for it? 
Uh, I thought I did at the time, of <laughs> course, and, and you try, you know, you read the papers, you try to, and this was before the advent of internet and yeah. social media and all sure. that. So, so uh, that was really sitting down, you know, understanding what current affairs was. But as a JC student, I already had that because I had mm. the, G, the GP program. We had written uh, essays in the past about current affairs, I'd taken part in quizzes and things like that. So uh, don't, uh, in that sense, you know, just echoing what David says, don't be too worried about it. Uh, the idea behind the test is not to test you on your knowledge of the law. It is to test you on the potential that you have in terms of your analytical abilities, in terms of your reasoning abilities. Mm. Um, and, and once we see that there is something there that mm. we can work with, that we can mold, that we can uh, you know, polish until you shine, then you know, that, that is what we're looking for. So, so don't worry too much about being overly prepared in terms of the knowledge or the content of the law. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that's very, very good advice from, from Ja. And uh, maybe just to uh, uh, conclude some of the other uh, questions, there's quite a few questions I think that are about um, uh, what the JD classes at NUS uh, are, are like, right? And um, this may be a good way to talk about generally how we teach in NUS and, and, and in a sense that there's not that much difference how we teach a JD uh, an LLB and, a, and, a, and an LLM student. Uh, but yes, I think the specific question is, um, do JD classes at NUS focus more on problem-based learning or is it more theoretical? And then I think there's a very specific question from someone about whether uh, they want to balance this part-time day teaching and whether it would be possible to do the, 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 the JD while doing something uh, else as, as, as well. So maybe these are things that, yeah. um, David, you can just handle? Sure. I, I would start with the part-time uh, first. I, I don't think you, it's easy to balance. So I would say we don't have a part-time JD. Uh, but, so it's a full-time JD program. Uh, it would be a challenge if you still have a current job and you're trying to do this. So you have to fit your work commitments around a very rigorous uh, program. So it's, it's full time. You're expected to spend uh, possibly like 40 hours a week doing your reading and then attending maybe up to 12 hours of classes. Uh, so it's going to be a heavy program and, and it's not part time at the moment. And in, in terms of uh, whether it's problem-based or not, it depends on the subjects you do. So when you study something like contract, torts, criminal law, it's more problem-based. Uh, but at the same time, we do have legal systems of Asia to give you a knowledge of the legal setups in China, India, Myanmar, Vietnam, for instance, uh, or legal theory, where it's a bit more theoretical. So it's something that every lawyer needs to do, you know, a bit of theory, a bit of problem solving. Uh, and then at the same time, you have to do your writing skills, mm -hmm. your uh, communication, written oral communication. Mm -hmm. so, so a JD program very much mirrors uh, the current LLB program, at least for the three-year JD. For the two-year JD, you are exempted on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on your years of experience, what you've done. So if you worked in a top law firm for 10 years, we might exempt you from contract law. You know, but then there are certain other uh, compulsory subjects you have to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that's a good point maybe to... Oh yeah, please the, go ahead. On go the ahead. LLM program, because I did the LLM program, uh, this was before mm. the time of the JD, which is going to be launched. Um, and that is a full-time program as well. Uh, but during that time, I was able to run my lacuna training business, do workshops. I was able to write a complete textbook. So it's, it's really about your ability to juggle as well. Mm -hmm. And for mm -hmm. at least for the LLM program, because I'm familiar with that, uh, the, the subjects you choose are all electives. Mm -hmm. So you kind of plan your own timetable. And if you're clever about it, <laughs> right, you, you are able to, to sort of fit uh, and, and have that sort of balance uh, if you do need to attend to uh, work matters and things like that. So I wouldn't say um, it is impossible, but it is, yes, it is a challenge and it was a challenge for me. Uh, and, you know, thankfully I have a very supportive uh, network and, and uh, support system back at home. So, so it was able, I was able to do that. And I had a lot of uh, friends who actually, they were balancing not just work like me, but they were balancing family as well. So, so uh, another colleague of mine from the family court joined me for the LLM program and she has a kid. And, you know, so she was uh, a 
running between that and, and school, but she still managed to do very, very well for the LLM program. So it's possible, but you need to know yourself, you need to know your limitations and, and sort of work around that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and maybe, so I'm thinking this is a good point for us to segue and um, sort of discuss some of the commonalities, right? Because um, uh, our friends may not be aware, but um, at NUS Law, uh, while some parts of the curriculum are, um, you know, LLB only, um, and some parts of the JD curriculum will also be JD only, um, we, there's a vast uh, uh, overlap uh, typically, sort of uh, for, for our uh, undergraduate students, there's almost two years, and I think for the JD students, there'll also be almost two years during which they can um, choose electives, and those electives uh, will be attended uh, by the JD students, uh, undergraduate students, and by LLB st uh, LLM students side by side. So, uh, although you're pursuing uh, different uh, degrees, you're learning from each other, you're attending class together, and there's a, a wonderful exchange of view, experience, um, and intellectual curiosity that happens in those um, electives. So I think this may be a good time to talk a little bit about our, um, perhaps our learning pedagogy, um, uh, uh, how, how we teach, because I think there are quite a, a few questions here about, you know, what is an NUS law class like? And perhaps for some of our friends from uh, uh, slightly different uh, uh, backgrounds, you've attended uh, your uh, first degree or your first law degree in a, um, in a, uh, in a civil law background um, or somewhere else in Asia. Um, you might be interested to, to know just what it's like uh, to study in NUS and what kind of teaching methods we use here, etc. So um, this may be a good time for us to talk a little bit about that and I throw this first to, to Simon, I think, to give the overview. Sure, so we were talking earlier about the written test for the JD and this is one reason why why we interview for the JD as well, and indeed for our LLB, not just to, to screen the applicants, but also because it's in many ways a road test for what it's going to be like to be in the classroom, because we expect you to be active learners, participants. Uh, and for some of you, that might be a bit different from your education up until now. Um, many of our classes have a significant proportion of the assessment is class participation. So that's not quantity. It's not just always putting your hand up. It's often quality. It's the questions that you ask. It's the engagement that you have. Uh, and so all of our classes are interactive. We have some lecture tutorial format classes, but th those large format lectures are always counterbalanced by tutorials. The vast majority of the classes are seminar style. So the professor expects you to have done some preparation before class uh, and expects you to be actively engaged in a discussion in the classroom. But then what are we trying to impart? And this echoes what David was saying earlier. I tend to lump it into three baskets uh, of uh, doctrine, skills, and perspectives. In terms of doctrine, this is the understanding of what the law is. There is just some stuff you just need to know. The skills are how you practice law, how you advocate on behalf of a client, how you draft a contract, how you interpret a decision, uh, how, you, how you can work as a lawyer. Uh, and one of the things we've been expanding is our experiential learning program through our Centre for Pro Bono and Clinical Legal Education. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, perspectives, an understanding not just of what the law is, how to practice it, but why it is the way that it is. Uh, and that's where theory and comparative law come in, uh, which really speaks to the, the diversity of the faculty and the diversity of the subjects that we offer. Uh, so in answer to the question, is it more theory or practice or skills? Yes, it's everything, mm -hmm. and it should be. Yeah, and um, I think there was a question sort of about class sizes. Um, yeah, David? Uh, so it, it depends whether you are in a lecture tutorial format. Most of our classes are in seminar style. So seminar style means you are assigned a set of readings, you do it, you come into class, there's a discussion for about three hours. And those class sizes are kept at 50 students. Uh, for most of our electives, 120 electives we have, they're taught in this manner. And we're going to have JD, LLM and LLB students in the same class, but they're all graded separately, so don't worry about that. Uh, we do have a number of the doctrinal classes like torts, contract, uh, property law, which are taught in a lecture tutorial format. This means the entire cohort attends the lecture and then you're broken up into smaller groups of about 12 to 15 per tutorial group. So this is where the JD students will attend their own uh, tutorial groups. 
uh, well, but then you'll have the same lectures as, say, the LLB students. So we do have a different mix of uh, teaching methods depending on the subjects you're doing. Okay, yeah. And um, Jia, I'm just wondering yes. whether sort of as uh, someone who's undergone the, the, the classes, um, mm. you know, you, you would probably have had some um, friends from overseas yes, uh, who, who, who uh, <laughs> went through the LLM together with mm. you. Um, may, maybe, uh, you know, are there, are there some comments that they gave like uh, contrasting their um, studies and, uh, you know, so are there things that maybe we need to warn our friends from, from overseas about what our <laughs> teaching methods are like uh, based on um, your knowing on the ground what were some of the reactions to our teaching methods? Well, um, okay, so the first thing that is a bit different at NUS is the fact that, like you said, um, the students from different courses actually take some electives mm. together. And this doesn't happen in, in a vast majority mm -hmm. of the universities because master students stick to the master students class, you know, uh, undergrads stick to the undergrads class. But I mean, to my mind, actually, having them take these courses together is a very enriching experience for both uh, the undergrads and the postgrads because the postgrads will then bring, you know, whatever experience that they've had since they've left after getting their LLBs, uh, you know, and they'll bring that back, right? So practical experience that they've had, work experience that they've had, they can give real life examples, which if the LLB students had just kept to the LLB mm. students, they wouldn't have gotten that perspective. So, um, and then now with the JD program, you know, again, there will be people from all over the world, there will be people uh, who, who have different uh, backgrounds that may not even be legal backgrounds coming together and sharing that experience. So that richness uh, cannot be understated. So that, that's one thing. The second thing uh, for my international law friends who, uh, international friends who did the LLM together with me, I think for, for a lot of them, um, perhaps the rigor was something they may not have expected. There, there are heavy readings, you know, we, we won't uh, uh, shy away from that. But that is the background reading so that we can have that depth of discussion. So it is something which is necessary. Uh, it is something that uh, I think the international students uh, took a while to get used to in that sense. But once they got the hang of it, uh, it came quite you know, naturally and easily to them. The other thing uh, I would say is um, that mix as well of mm. international and local mm, mm. Um, also led to very interesting discussions in class because mm. a simple hypothetical problem could be dealt with uh, in a local context in a certain way. And then there would be a discussion about, well, how would it happen or how would it be dealt with in a civil law country or in, you know, where, where they had come from and, and things like that. So very, very interesting discussions mm -hmm. took place in the LLMs, which um, my international uh, friends uh, did say that, you know, it, it, was, it was something very, very different from what they had experienced uh, back in their home countries. Yeah. Right, right. Can I just address something that some of you might be thinking, well, why would I do a graduate degree and sit alongside undergraduates? Because mm -hmm. this is not, as Jia said, this yeah. is not something that's extremely common, but we do it for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, well, one sort of special pleading is our Singaporean students are brilliant. Uh, it, Singapore's education system is famous around the world and we get some of the very best. Also to reassure some of you, the men are at least two years older. The men have done national service. So you're not sitting among a whole group of teenagers. They've all oh, finished come on, their- the women are- um, No, the women, you know, the, the the women, women are mature. We, 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 we all know that as a matter of- yeah, So right. that we are on the yeah. same level. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. True that's enough, right. true enough. You know, Sanya, you then, just stepped right into that. I have <laughs> walked into it again. Yeah. But then the, the, the last thing I'd say on this is that this actually is what creates that incredible cosmopolitan atmosphere in the electives. It enables us to offer this 120 plus electives, mm -hmm. but also ensures that the average elective has about half Singaporean and half from all over the world. And one group we haven't talked about because we didn't have them this year, but we will by the time you're here, yep. is exchange students. Mm. So course. we have partner arrangements with uh, 50 plus institutions in 20 countries around the world. Uh, and so what that means is our classroom truly is global mm -hmm. with strong Singaporean and Asian representation, but really everywhere represented. Right. And I think that also, I think, addresses uh, the question from um, one of the attendees who's concerned about student life as an uh, LLM uh, student and asks whether there are activities to forge friendships or just studying and more studying. I like a, rig I like a rigorous
rigorous curriculum, but I want to experience life as an overseas graduate student. And I, I think, um, so I, I, I won't pretend that um, the, the LLM cohort has quite the same um, sort of feel as our undergraduate cohort, which tends to kind of, you know, uh, be at that age in their life where there's, um, you know, they, they want to socialise a lot and they've all come from the same school. So, you know, um, uh, they, they, they hang around a lot together. Um, I think the, the, the master's students that I've seen, my graduate students that I've seen, um, are a little bit more chill about hanging out in big groups, um, but there are plenty of opportunities um, if you uh, join us uh, to socialize not just with um, fellow LLM or JD students, also with the undergraduates who welcome you to all of their uh, activities. Um, as someone in charge of student life, um, I try to make sure that we always have social activities to which you are um, invited. We also try to have um, an orientation program that, uh, for those of you who will be joining us from overseas, uh, that uh, um, you know, familiarizes you uh, to Singapore, our lovely environments here um, near the Botanic Gardens, um, a, a beautiful, beautiful campus, the larger campus at Kent Ridge, and of course, all the um, various parts of uh, Singapore. And I'm, I'm I, well, as um, together with, with, with David and, and Ja, uh, I'm a native Singaporean, and we, we accept Simon as being almost <laughs> Singaporean as well, since he's been here so long. So I'm really proud of this country. Um, I think it's a beautiful place, and um, there, there'll be plenty of opportunity, I think, for you to enjoy um, uh, where you are, in, a, uh, in addition to, of course, quite a bit of studying and, and studying and more studying. Yeah, I, I can chime in here, uh, speaking on behalf of the, the international students that I, I did my LLM with. A lot of them actually chose Singapore because of its location. So uh, Singapore is known as being that hub uh, in Asia, and it's also a good uh, jumping off point to go for you know, road trips and, and, and you know, different parts of Asia. We can, you can take a short trip to Australia, to New Zealand. It's a good location. Mm -hmm. Of course, with COVID, of course, with these restrictions, uh, that has changed somewhat. So doing an LLM program or a JD program, if you're an international uh, you know, student coming to Singapore, there are those restrictions which you would not have had uh, pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. right? And that was actually a very major reason why we had a, a large uh, mm -hmm. pool of, of international students coming to Singapore because it was a great way to travel and see this entire region. Um, but that said, uh, I don't think, uh, you know, it's any less of an experience because, like we said, if all of you are coming here, right, then that richness is here, yep. right? It is, it is here and, and we have that richness in the classroom. The other thing is um, what Singapore offers, I think quite apart from what NUS offers, mm. what Singapore offers is an extremely safe and extremely clean environment. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a country where women can go jogging at midnight. And, and they will not be harassed. And I think that is something to be said about, about coming to Singapore, if, if that is something that is on your mind um, and something that you, you want to see. Yep. And also a very cosmopolitan um, uh, culture, just, just generally, not, not just in, in NUS. Simon, you look like you had something you wanted to yeah, say. No, so I'm, I'm glad that Jav <laughs> mentioned the, both the pandemic and yeah. rule of law in Singapore. And just on the pandemic, uh, we have obviously prioritized first and foremost the safety of our students and staff. Uh, and indeed, we're very quick to move online in, in accordance with safe distancing measures. So last semester, the second half of 2020, we were almost entirely online. But as the situation stabilized in Singapore, we're now back to almost entirely, like, well, the vast majority of our classes are in person, up to 50 students in a room with masks, safe distancing and so on. Uh, and so we have uh, both experienced the online phenomenon and now we're both doing in-person and, as necessary, hybrid classes. So our hope is, and our plan is for the students who are coming in late this year, uh, and certainly in future years, uh, to do those rich in-person experiences. Uh, and then on Singapore and the rule of law, and I say this as a father of a teenage daughter, I echo what Jai was saying about the importance of safety and security. But also, just for foreigners, Singapore is a fascinating petri dish for what the rule of law means to a country. Uh, because Singapore's success over the last half century can be tied in no small part to its embrace of the rule of law and the extent to which law permeates the culture. And you can be critical of that. You can be critical of Singapore's position on capital punishment, um, caning and so on, mandatory uh, uh, situations, mandatory penalties in some situations. 
Um, but I think there is a rich discussion within Singapore and certainly within NUS about what the rule of law has meant to Singapore. Uh, and I think that's something particularly for foreigners who don't grow up in this environment. I found fascinating and many of our graduate students learn a lot from. Mm. I just wanted to cycle back just a little bit to talk about COVID. Um, and I think to, I mean, obviously we, we can't make guarantees. Um, you know, a, a year ago uh, was the first time that we had had to do this open house uh, in a remote way. Uh, I think very few of us would have predicted that a year later we would still be doing the open house um, in, uh, by, by in, in this way. But um, here we are. So we, I, we can't really predict what's going to happen um, in the next few months. But I think I can say with some assurance that Singapore has figured out how to let people come in uh, in a safe way. And um, different from the situation uh, last year around this time, uh, I think that if you uh, take a look at our, uh, the various government websites on um, how to come to Singapore, the situation is fairly stable. If we plan ahead, uh, there should be a way for you to come to Singapore uh, to um, stay out the, the quarantine um, in, in fairly comfortable surroundings and then to be able to start school um, on time and to be able to attend physical classes. I think on, on NUS side, I think what we will uh, be able pretty much to guarantee is that there will be some physical classes and then I think the other side of the equation which is whether you'll be able to come and join us for that um, there may be, it, it may be um, a little less convenient than it would have been a few years ago, but at this stage in the pandemic, we are um, roughly able to give you a sense of what the process is so that you can come in. And, um, you know, like, I, I'm, I'm going to find some wood if I can to touch um, here, <laughs> because obviously um, I, I, I do sometimes seem prescient to my students, but I'm not. Uh, but uh, uh, <laughs> you could touch that part of the botanic gardens you stole. Right, right. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> touching wood. Touching wood. Uh, but 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 I, I I think that sort of sitting here, um, uh, looking a bit uh, forward, I I, I hope that um, with a with a bit of planning, um, most of you, uh, if you want to come in this uh, next academic year, should be able plan ahead. You should be able to, to come here. David, you you think I'm yeah yeah, yeah I'm yeah. I'm right about that, right? Yeah. Provided. There's what? no fourth wave somewhere else yeah. around true, the world true. That, that the vaccine cannot handle. <laughs> so let's not go there, David. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let, let's 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 really uh, not go there. I think uh, someone also asked, kind of, um, you know, whether uh, um, COVID will impact things like um, their opportunity to work in Singapore if they come here for an LLM. And I think again, the short answer is probably no. Uh, 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 you know, uh, people, uh, students who come here uh, to take the LLM are allowed to do a little bit of work. Uh, there's a limit on the number of hours that you can do, but you are allowed to do it. And um, uh, you know, it is um, uh, it is known for 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 some of our LLM candidates or our international friends to come to Singapore and then after that uh, to to stay on and 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 find work here. Uh, it's it's not the standard case. It's not that everyone does that, and I do have to be clear that um, uh, most of our master students come here to do the degree, um, but really as a way to prepare themselves to return home and advance their careers there rather than to stay on here. Um, but uh, uh, some of them do go on to work here. And of course, for those of our friends who come and do the JD, then that is very much the gateway towards practice in, in Singapore. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, and this is something that sort of segues into uh, some happy news that came out today, which is, uh, is global rankings of law schools. Now, law professors around the world know that rankings should be taken with a grain of salt. They're methodologically dubious uh, to be taken lightly. But if you do well, you tell the world about them. Uh, and we were very pleased to be ranked 10th in the world uh, in the rankings that just came out today. But I, I raise that not, not to trumpet our achievement, but to say that when you drill into them, as I did this afternoon, uh, you see that the reason we've done well is only partly my colleagues and my research is decently ranked. Um, our academic reputation is decently ranked. But the thing we do best, the thing we were ranked fifth in the world, is our reputation among employers. And that's a global survey. So that's an indication, if you like, that we have a good brand name, not just for the faculty, although I hope we do a decent job, but because our graduates go out to be successful, not just in Singapore, but as I said earlier, around the world, both in law firms and beyond. 
Uh, and so in and terms of a specific question on this, yeah. I think, and mm. it, it probably applies both to the to those who have an LLM from us as well as those who um, will, will soon be getting a JD from us about the reputation of uh, NUS law uh, graduates um, for in international firms, right? Mm. So I think here in Singapore, obviously, um, we take it for granted that people know what uh, being associated with NUS means. But there's a specific question about international law firms. I wondered if you wanted to, to, to talk well, so about that. Too. Very briefly, our students go on to all sorts of magnificent careers. I once um, sort of made a uh, wrote a speech saying we have partners at all the major law firms in Singapore. New York, London, Shanghai, Hong Kong. And then I asked someone, can you just check this is true? And of course it was true. Uh, and it also includes managing partners in, uh, I think, Latham Watkins. We had the managing partner of Latham Watkins worldwide was an NUS graduate. Uh, and so, yes, I think you will find NUS law graduates from the LLB, the LLM, and increasingly from the JD everywhere, both in law and in other fields. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, David, anything to add to that? Uh, no, but I, I see some questions about uh, people asking about JD exemptions. I, I just want to say, okay. it, when you get in, you can start asking those questions. It's <laughs> probably a bit <laughs> premature to ask which modules you can be exempted uh, when we haven't made any offers yet and the written test is to come this uh, Saturday. But maybe, okay, <laughs> while, while we're having some of these uh, uh, specific questions, are there some that you'd be prepared to answer? For example, you know, I, I'll, I'll just throw them to you, and if you don't want to answer, you say, you know, yeah. pass, pass. The, pass the <laughs> test first, pass. right? Pass the test first, then you pass, sure. okay? So, can an NUS Law LLM student apply for JD? Or is it possible to extend your LLM program to a JD program? No, I, I think you have to do a fresh application because okay. I think the fundamental difference is an LLM does not qualify you for practice in Singapore mm -hmm. and, and a JD qualifies you for practice. I think that, that is the main difference. So mm -hmm. uh, let's say if you've just finished an LLM here, uh, you can apply for the JD. Uh, is a fresh application. So we're not going to count your year of mm -hmm. LLM, say, towards a, a JD. Mm -hmm. But then you already have a law degree. So you know, before you get into an LLM, you must have a law degree. So what you'll be applying for is a two-year JD program mm -hmm. if you already have an LLM. So you see, there are lots of people who sort of want to spend more time with us. Um, so I, I, have, I have someone who asks, should I apply for LLM instead of JD if I don't really want to practice in Singapore, but... I do like to be able to spend two years studying in Singapore, right? So that, that, that's what question. Another sort of limited, uh, 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 linked question is, in my country, the LLM is a two-year course, and we can do an exchange for one semester in another overseas university. Will NUS start an LLM course like that and allow exchange? So at least spend one and a half years here and then do exchange, right? So these are people who are um, a bit dissatisfied that, um, David, you, you only want to hold them here for one year and, and, and give them the LLM quite so quickly. And they want to spend a bit more time with us, right? You, you could fail every subject, <laughs> fail every subject and repeat. Um, or do the year and then go travelling for six months mm, 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 uh, and travel yeah. all around the world. Mm. No, Sorry, that's a flippant answer. Do you have a yes. serious answer? Is there answer? a serious answer? <laughs> no, no, that, that's a perfect answer be, because I, I think many top universities uh, have an LLM in one year, like Harvard, uh, Oxford, Melbourne. You know, so I, I don't think it needs two years. So we are comparing ourselves with the best. Uh, therefore, I think one year is about right. I don't think we have a two-year LLM at this point. Okay, although, yeah, although yeah, you, more yeah. seriously, you could do two LLMs. Yes, you, you could, could do an LLM specialization. Okay. Yes. You could say, I want to do the full range of specialization. That would be masochistic. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> that's right. But we, we clearly uh, attract oh, masochistic uh, people. Oh, you could do an LLM and then a PhD, I suppose. Oh, yeah. yeah you could so, do so true, because th that could be a pathway to um, <laughs> academia and, uh, and all, right? And since, you know, since, since we're on the subject of masochists and, 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 and sadists, um, I, um, you know, there, there's, a, there's someone who's asked a specific question to David. So I'm going to keep you on the oh, hot does it seat. Say David? <laughs> it does. It does what it says. I'd like to, pr to pose a question to Prof Tan. Oh. I think okay. there's only one, right? All yeah, right. okay. What were your underlying principal considerations when designing the JD program curriculum? I'm asking this to understand the behaviors you are intending to cultivate in a law student, and by that, 
I think I'll then be able to see the implications of that student's actions in the world. It is a deep question, David, and it must be for you because it has named you. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the rest of us are going, thank God we don't have to answer that one, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think um, the, the, the JD is a very prestigious degree that qualifies you for practice in Singapore. So in designing it, we wanted to make sure you have the right skills and the right doctrine, as mm -hmm. Professor Chessman had said, and the right perspectives. So it's designed with a compulsory modules. Uh, for example, you do tort contract company law, that gives you the doctrine. You do legal theory, these are all compulsory, it gives you the perspectives. And then you do legal analysis, research, communications, that gives you the skills. And then we have uh, externships, and these are clinical programs. Uh, for instance, you can do international commodity trading law clinic. If you want to practice in that area, uh, you work with a law firm for a few hours a week, you're given tasks to do, you get graded for that. That's if you want to go in that area. If you don't, you, you can say, uh, do more IP modules and then uh, IP arbitration, for instance, uh, social media regulation, privacy data protection. So, so we do give you then the building block in your final year of the JD where you can select electives in specific areas of law you want to practice. So the principles in which we design that is to first give you the building blocks in doctrine, skills and perspectives, and then give you the, the pathways, the different path, pathways for you to choose uh, your electives. Okay. Um, just, yeah, very, very good. Very good. I'm, I'm, I'm just blown away, but so much that I want to ask you the next question again and, and just keep you there. So, but this, is, this, is, this should be a simple question to ask. Us. Um, uh, I think um, one of the attendees um, does understand that um, uh, the JD is a full-time program, but I think um, has some other commitments and wants to know whether it would be possible to do only, I think, what, two modules per, per semester, I, I guess, to, to half load, right? And um, I'm suspecting that you're going to take a hard line and say the answer is no. Yeah, mm. cu currently the answer is no. That, that's because the JD is very competitive. We have a very small number of spaces. That's because of the regulatory quota that the Ministry of Law imposes. So I think at this point in time, uh, we have to go with the full-time students first. Maybe in later years, we can see how we ease up a number of part-time spaces, but at least okay. uh, for the next two intakes, I think it has been on a full-time basis. That being said, we have published our timetable mm -hmm. online. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can take a look at that possibly around May, if, if you get a place for, for, from us and then decide whether or not you want to you know, continue with the JD program and that fits into your work commitments. Okay. We've been paying a lot of attention to David and to the JD program. So I think we'll sort of switch back a little bit and um, uh, uh, maybe address some of the questions from our LLM uh, uh, friends. I think one of them that comes up quite a bit is sort of this idea of internships while doing an, an LLM and maybe working while, while, while doing an LLM. And I addressed that a little bit, I think, um, uh, when talking about how for international students, you, you, you can work, but um, there is a limit to the number of hours that you can do it. But maybe it's also a bigger question about whether the workload and the, you know, whether it's feasible as an LLM student. And I think no, no one better to, to, to answer that, to pass that back to you. And I know you've addressed this slightly already, but maybe one more time, Ja, what were all the amazing things you were doing while also doing an LLM that tell us that maybe we need to increase the workload, right? No, 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 no. Please don't put that on me. Um, um, but yes, I... I... I was able to, to run my training business and, and basically what I did for my training business mm. was I, uh, the law firms outsourced their legal skills training to me. So I conducted private trainings. I conducted public workshops for uh, the lawyers to get their CPD points. Um, I also wrote a full length textbook that's about 600 pages long. So it's, it's possible. Mm -hmm. It's just how much commitment mm. you, you, you have and how much time you're willing to sort of put in, mm. uh, you know, to, to achieve all the things that you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. So I suppose the, the adage goes where there's a will, there's a way. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of will. <laughs> and so there was a way. Uh, but yeah, that, that it I would is possible, say it is right? possible, yep. entirely possible, but you need to know your limitations. You need to be able to juggle your time. Right. And I think uh, there's a related question here about someone wanting to make the best of, of their time here. Uh, is it possible to take classes at 
other schools of the university, uh, such as Chinese language classes or business or politics classes, if you are an LLN student? Is uh, that you, one thing too I, much, I think David? You, you can do it, but it wouldn't be for credit because uh, just adding on to Ja, you, you do in an LLM program uh, four subjects mm. a semester. That's 12 contact hours. Mm. And then you add in your reading, maybe another 40 hours if you mm -hmm. want to be diligent. Yeah, so, so in fact, it's a very full curriculum. But uh, if you want to say do two additional subjects uh, for no credit, and enrichment, we call it enrichment, but we, we can allow that, yes. Okay. But it's not going to be counted towards the LLM. Yes, I think there was a question also by someone who wanted to say, you know, there's so many uh, interesting um, subjects. Is it possible for an LLM student to sit in on modules that... Yes, you um, can. Yes, you, you can, can right? Yeah. Absolutely the, the law true. module is not a problem because we have 120 electives. Mm. Uh, you only take eight in an LLM program. That's all you do, eight subjects. Or you can do up to 10, uh, some of the smaller credit module. Uh, so you're welcome to sit in the other classes, mm. not mm. a problem. It's quite clear we are attracting a lot of um, people who are interested in doing a lot of work, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, to this. I so, think I started that. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, no, but it's, it's, it's great because uh, that's the Singapore ethic, that's the NUS exactly, law that's sort exactly of uh, uh, ethic for. and culture. So um, it's wonderful. Sorry, Simon. I mean, oh, yeah. uh, we, we, we've, we've now sort of gone off the, the rails <laughs> where we're, we're, we're giving the impression that, you know, we just sit around kind of laughing at each other the whole time. Bring us back down to earth, Simon. Well, I, I was going to go where I, I suspected you were going to go, which mm. is that to get the most out of it, by all means work hard, but also play hard. Mm. Get to know your fellow students, learn mm. about Singapore, travel around the region. Uh, and on the specific question of job prospects, one of the things mm. that some, focusing on the LLM, where you can't practice Singapore law, one thing that uh, LLM students, some of them have gone on to be kind of ambassadors for their own jurisdiction. So we've had, uh, I had a graduate student who was qualified in Italy, who came and set up an Italian branch of a law firm here. Uh, students from China and India are often high demand here. Uh, and so there are lots of opportunities, uh, but in terms of uh, the, the degree, it's a bit what, like the, the great Tom Lehrer said of life being like a sewer, what you get out of it depends on what you put into it. <laughs> What was that? Oh, that was the punchline, was it? <laughs> okay, all right. Um, okay, uh, we, we, are, we are coming down to the last few minutes, and I don't want to, um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to keep people longer um, than, than we need to, because I know that many of you are signing in here from um, different parts of the world, and it's, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, different times for you, perhaps. Um, so um, I'm, I'm going to run through and see whether there are just a few more questions that we, we didn't answer and that we could address. Quick if, yeah, round. quick fire round. Uh, and then final quick fire round where each of you will kind of get, um, you know, your last words that you, you want to say to them, right? So I'm going to start. Let me go. Um, how important is my work experience which is related to law when I apply for LLM? I don't have an LLB degree, but I'm interested in a one-year LLM. I don't want to spend three years in JD, and I think the answer may be we don't usually take no. people in who um, don't already have an LLB. I need a scholarship. I heard that it is very difficult to get one. Can you tell me how I can make myself more competitive to obtain one? Just got this one? Actually, I, I, I did my LLM on a scholarship. So, so if you know me, I'm not from a particularly well-to-do family. So uh, even though I had spent some years working, a lot of that money was sort of plowed back uh, to my dependents and all that. So when I wanted to do the LLM program, I needed to get funding. So for the Singaporean students, uh, your first uh, higher degree, you actually get MOE subsidy. Um, and then over and above that, I was able to get uh, financial assistance. So I, am, I was uh, given the Kwa Gok Chu scholarship uh, to do my LLM uh, at NUS. So um, another thing that had changed over the last 10 years between my bachelor's and my LLM was a, a lot more financial assistance schemes. Mm -hmm. So in terms of scholarships, in terms of bursaries, especially for the locals, um, there are a lot of those available. So if you qualify, uh, do apply for that and that will help you significantly. Yeah. And there's also a question about whether we can get financial help for the JD, and uh, the short answer again is yes. Um, they're, un, um, they're both needs-based as well as merit-based uh, fin financial options uh, that can help you. I can just address the, the 
candidates who don't get financial assistance mm -hmm. and for the graduate students, we don't normally, as, as Jan mm. said, the undergraduates, they, there's financial support in Singapore, but graduates, it's predominantly merit-based. But if you don't get a scholarship, I mean, we appreciate this is expensive, but we try and make it worthwhile. We, we understand that people are spending a year with us, that they're spending real money, uh, and so we have a real obligation to offer you the very best education we can. Uh, and so all of that money goes into offering a rich academic program with world-class faculty. So we at least hope it's worth it and we hope you agree with it with us after uh, graduating. And that's a good note on which to begin the final, final uh, quick fire round, right? Uh, so uh, we'll go from right to left because um, I always yeah, like to yeah. no because I always <laughs> like to end up on the left of almost every issue. <laughs> okay, um, from the right, final words to to um, to our friends out there who are thinking of coming to the US. To those who are thinking of doing your LLM, having worked for quite a few years, and maybe for some of you there's a little bit of hesitance because you think, well, I haven't been a student for a really long time. Am I able to be a student again? Will it be difficult to adjust and things like that? Um, I came from you know, mid-career in, in that sense, so I, I had worked for uh, 10 years and then I came back and, and did my LLM and actually I, I found it to be even more enjoyable for that reason because uh, the last time I was in school, I studied for the sake of getting a job and this time when I came back and I did my LLM, I studied for the sake of learning new things and so it was a truly enriching experience which I think because I had seen the working world, because I had seen the true application of the law uh, you know, in practice, uh, it made all that much more sense to me now that I was learning uh, about it in school. So, so speaking to that crowd, if you are feeling hesitant, if you think you know, you've been out of school for so long, you don't want to come back or you're afraid to come back, uh, please you know, don't think of it as a disadvantage in any way. Actually, I'll skip Simon for now. I'll just go to David first. And let no, Simon have the last I, word. Lah. I thought, uh, it made me think about mm. some of the students I taught in the LLM program. Um, I asked them, why do you come from Italy or the Czech Republic mm. or Switzerland? Mm. You're all in my class. Mm. And I said, why, why did you come to NUS? They said, because they'll get a promotion when they go back home. And I thought, hey, that, that's okay. great. So, so they said, we went online and we typed in best law school in Asia because Asia is the growing region of the world. Uh, and then they came. So someone from Italy had to convince an American law firm which employed him that he doesn't need to go to an American law school for the LLM because Asia is a growing region. And then they sent him to Asia, he went back, he got a promotion. So I think think strategically about whether you want to do an LLM in say corporate financial services law, international arbitration, and then look at what Asia is good in, what Singapore is good in, and then come to NUS. <laughs> Simon, now yours. So I'd, I'd <laughs> echo all of that, but in addition to being strategic, in addition to um, thinking instrumentally about the value add a degree, the cost benefit analysis, this much in fees in a year versus this much in increased salary, think about stepping outside your comfort zone. Think about doing things just because you're interested in them. Because for the vast majority of you, whether you're doing the JD, the LLM, particularly if you're doing the PhD, this is going to be the last time in your career that you're doing something just out of interest. Uh, and so much as you should do the specialisations, we structure the degrees so that you don't only have to do those specialisations, you can do these other things. You can do enrichment, you can travel, you can join a sports club, and a cultural club, get involved in things, because that's what a university experience should be. Uh, and so if any of that sounds attractive to you, we hope to see you on our beautiful Booker Timber campus sometime soon. Right, and on that note, I want to once again thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know that some of you may, after this session, um, have some further questions. Um, uh, we've got plenty of stuff up on our websites, and I'm going to ask my colleagues perhaps to um, uh, communicate with all of you who registered for this um, and let you know uh, what is a website where you can, um, if you really are that masochistic, watch this um, session again. Uh, also watch some of uh, our previous webinars that feature our different LLM specializations. So we've got quite a few, including some on IT, some on uh, finance, uh, some on uh, Asian uh, legal systems. So, um, you know, uh, uh, we, we, we've had some webinars where we focused uh, on uh, each of these different specializations and they're up on our website as well. So you can go take a look at that. Um, so we'll, we'll give you all of that 
the information, please um, feel free to do um, to, to look at all these resources. And then if you've still got questions, uh, because like I said at the beginning, I do know you have many choices and um, we want to help you uh, find out as much as possible so that you make NUS your choice, um, just write to us and um, ask and we'll try to address uh, the questions best as we can. Uh, so this is, I hope, not the end of our engagement with you. Uh, we look forward to seeing you here um, with us. If not in this coming year, then um, uh, whenever uh, fortune, safety, health, and um, uh, your other circumstances allow you to come and be with us. Good night. <laughs>